Pass it. Hey everybody, Dr. O. Let's review the integumentary system. So, what are the two layers of the cutaneous membrane, also known as your skin, what are the two key differences between them? So, your cutaneous membrane is going to be the epidermis and the underlying dermis. Now, you also do have a hypodermis. You've probably heard the term hypodermic needle. Um, it's usually called the subcutaneous layer, which means it's below the cutaneous membrane, your skin. That's primarily fat, adipose tissue and but uh, um, the two key differences, so your epidermis is going to be avascular. We'll go, we'll go through each of the strata or layers here in a moment. But your epidermis is going to be avascular, whereas your dermis is vascular. That's why if you cut yourself and it's not very deep, it, it'll still hurt because there are receptors there, but it won't bleed. But if you cut yourself and you're bleeding, you know you've gotten through all of the layers of the epidermis and you're now into the dermis. The second big thing is the dermis is where, so you see hair and you, you know you have sweat glands and sebaceous glands and these kind of things. You see them on the surface of your skin, on the epidermis, but the dermis is where they come from and then they, they kind of weave their way up through the epidermis. So those are the two key layers and the two key differences. Okay, what's the difference between thin skin and thick skin? So we'll kind of touch on this when we get to the, the five strata in a moment. But thin skin only has four strata. So it has the stratum basal or germinativum, um, the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, and the stratum corneum. It does not have the stratum lucidum, which would be found in thick skin. So thin skin is everywhere except thick skin is going to be on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. So the two key differences between your palms and soles and the rest of your body, your the palms of your hands and soles of your feet have thick skin, everywhere else is thin skin, and the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet don't have sebaceous glands. They don't have the oil glands. So, all right, um, so that's thin versus thick skin. This is the biggest part, I would say, of this whole review. Know the key fact, or two, or sometimes three, about each of the five strata. So I like to start deep and work our way to the surface. So first we have the stratum basal or stratum germinativum. So just so you know, basal cells and germinative cells are stem cells. That's why both those terms work really well. They're basically saying the strata or layer of the skin that's full of stem cells. So the stratum basal is where your skin stem cells are that are constantly being churned out to replace the cells that you lose every day. How many cells you lose every day depends on a lot of factors, but sometimes you see numbers in the billions. Uh, but uh, So every time a skin cell is lost, it should be replaced by a new one. Now, as we get older, skin cells are going to be lost fast, and they're not going to be replaced as quickly, so our, our, our skin does get thinner. But So the stratum basal or germinativum, first thing you think, that's where your skin stem cells are. That's where, you know, I see what you're seeing on the surface is the stratum corneum, but that, these cells were born in that stratum basal, that basal layer. Uh, the next big thing, the stratum basal, is where your melanocytes are. So the cells that produce melanin. The reason that's significant is because this is why melanoma is the most dangerous kind of skin cancer because the melanocytes are deep. They're real close to the dermis because they're basically sandwiched between the dermis and the epidermis. So if a melanocyte metastasizes and start to spread, it can jump into your blood supply or jump into your lymphatic supply, your lymphatic system, and spread throughout the body or metastasize in ways that other cancer wouldn't do, especially early on. So that's why it's so significant to know that the melanocytes are down there. So those are the two big ones for me. Um, so the stratum basal is where your skin cells are being born and also where your melanocytes are. So the next layer, the stratum spinosum, like I don't think this, this one is... Um, Basically, it's a continuation of the stratum basal. These stem cells are still dividing. I would say this uh, most important thing here is this is where your dendritic cells are, the, the, which are part, a very important part of your immune system. They're what are called antigen-presenting cells. So if, if you have a puncture and something's trying to get into your body through your skin, these cells are there to try to recognize that and help set up immunity against those. So that's the really about all you got to know about the stratum spinosum. The most important layer to me is the next one, the stratum granulosum. And the reason I say that is this is where skin cells become skin cells. So what are the skin cells that you see? They're dead, so they're, they're not dividing. They're dehydrated, and they're full of keratin. Well, guess what happens at this layer, the stratum granulosum? This is where your cells are keratinized, where that, where that tough water-resistant, not waterproof, but water-resistant protein is added. This is where these cells stop dividing, where they dehydrate, the water gets sucked out of them, and they die. So that's what I mean when I say the stratum granulosum is where a skin cell becomes a skin cell.
So that's the key stuff with the stratum granulosum. The next layer is called the stratum lucidum. And this is um, only found in thick skin. That's the only thing I know about that. Only going to be found on the palms of your hands and soles of your feet. Then we have the stratum corneum, which is, you know, 15 to 30 layers. So you're going to remember a strata is a layer of cell types, but each of these strata is multiple layers of cells. You, probably, you have at least 50 layers of skin cells. The stratum corneum is the, is the dead, keratinized skin cells that you see. They, spend the, they, they work their way up to the stratum corneum, spend a couple weeks there before they're sloughed off and replaced. So the skin you see, the most superficial skin, the, what we think of as skin would be stratum corneum. All right, so those make sure you know those. I have videos on you know both of both of my uh, channels and stuff for for the layers of the skin. Make sure you know that well. Okay, what is keratin? Keratin is a tough water resistant protein. It's added to the, you know the keratin keratinized stratified squamous of the skin, roof of your mouth. So keratin, I guess you could probably say that keratin is the second most common protein in the body behind collagen. So by far, the majority of the protein in your body is, or, you know, of, of your tissues is, is collagen. But um, keratin is very important. It's what makes your nails and your hair, and it also is what makes your skin water resistant. All right, where are melanocytes? What do they produce and why does it matter? So melanocytes, where are they? They're in the stratum basal. They're right there, like I said, sandwiched between the epidermis and the dermis. I told you why it's significant. What do they produce? They produce melanin. So don't get this confused with melatonin. Melatonin comes from the pineal gland and it regulates your body's day-night cycles or circadian rhythms. Mel melanin is what gives your skin its color, freckles and everything else. So um, why does it matter? Well, melanin's job is not just to give you skin color, it's to absorb UV rays. So this is why, you know, this is, you know, it's too bad how many things have happened in the world based on skin color and stuff, but we're all one race, the human race. You know, our skin looks different because of where our genes are from. And if you're some, from a part of the world where there's a ton of UV rays, you're, you want to have darker skin, it protects you. If you're from uh, a part of the world where there's not a lot of UV rays, darker skin, um, now it's not not it's still protecting you from UV rays, but the problem is it's going to hinder your ability to absorb vitamin D. So my genes are from Ireland, so I, I'm pretty pale versus someone whose genes are from the equator. But uh, so why does it matter when melanin, melanin's job is to absorb UV rays? It's also why we tan. If you if you're if you've been outside a long time, your body's going to respond to that extra UV rays by making melanin. So an interesting interesting thing here. Um, and whether you are, are dark, dark, dark black, or you're an albino, we have the same number of melanocytes. The, um, the amount of melanin they produce is what determines your skin color, not the presence or absence of a certain number of those cells. I've always, always found that significant. All right, what vitamin is produced when sunlight interacts with your epidermal cells? So actually cholesterol, steroid cholesterol cells in your skin, um, when UV right UV light strikes them, produces vitamin D. Now it takes the kidneys and takes the liver. It's actually pretty, pretty complicated, but that's why sun exposure will increase your vitamin D levels, especially if the sun has a lot of UV rays. You know, if you think where, where I live, basically anywhere above like Kansas and Missouri, from October to March, you know, I, I'm, I could go outside naked and I scare the neighbors, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be making uh, any appreciable amount of vitamin D. So it's the, the, the UV rays have to be strong enough to stimulate vitamin D production. That's why you make more vitamin D um, if, you're, if you're by the equator or during the, sun, uh, during the summer, in the middle of the day, these kind of things. All right, um, just real quickly, this is not a nutrition class, but vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a hormone. It's just, it's called vitamin D, but just so you know, it's much more significant than, than even most other vitamins. It, it is a hormone. It regulates the functions of li literally thousands of genes, hundreds of genes just on your white blood cells alone. So it plays a major role in your immune system. Um, getting enough vitamin D has been linked to protecting you from 17 different kinds of cancers the last time I checked. So very important to, to get vitamin D. If you can't get it from the sun, get it from supplemental form. All right, but that's not medical advice, just uh, I think it's important. Okay, what are the two layers of the dermis? So under those five strata, four or five, depending on where you're at, of the epidermis, you have the vascular dermis, and that's going to have the papillary layer and the reticular layer. Papillary means, papilla means nipple. So the papillary layer, it's named after the, the papillary, these ridges that they, that they form, this dermal papilla, and that's what gives you your fingerprints and gives your, you know, gives your, um, your skin the look it has. So um, it's not there just for fingerprints. You could make an argument that it plays a role in giving you a little bit of grip, but the main reason that you have uh, your dermis and epidermis are connected in this wavy pattern is to increase surface area so it's really, really held on tight. But uh, that's why it's called the uh, dermis dermal layer, sorry, the papillary layer of the dermis. The reticular layer, reticula means meshwork. So this is going to be where there's a meshwork of collagen and other, other things in this layer that basically house um, your glands and things like that. So things that you're seeing or seeing the end products of on the surface, they come from that deep in the dermis and snake their way up.
Okay, so those are the two layers of the dermis. Um, what muscle causes goosebumps? So when if they're called the erector pili muscles, when they contract, um, they your your hair stands on end, and that and that's where goosebumps come from. So uh, the main function of that, you know, you'd have to think heat generation. So you get, you know, that's why you get goosebumps when you're cold. Uh, what kind of gland is associated with each? Let's talk. So let's talk about some uh, some of the glands here. Um, I guess I have this coming up in a second with sweat glands too. What kind of gland is associated with each hair follicle? So every hair follicle has a sebaceous gland. Sebaceous glands produce sebum, the oily discharge that lubricates your hair and your skin. But sebaceous glands are not just around each hair follicle. They're spread all over your skin, except for the palms of your hands and soles of your feet, and associated with each hair follicle. So there are sebaceous glands all over the place, and they produce sebum. Sebum, it does lubricate your skin, but it also appears to be, uh, it slows bacterial movement, and it, it functions as part of your immune system as well. Okay, let's see. What determines your hair and skin color? So that's going to be uh, the amount of melanin would play a big role, but skin color and hair color, the other things play a role too, especially with skin. Carotenoids, so like the amount of carotenes in your body can affect skin color. That's why if you eat a whole bunch of carrots, you can actually start to get an orange, orange skin. So melan melanin, the carotenoids, and blood supply, they're all going to play a role in the color of your skin, but hair is primarily melanin, <clears throat> as is skin too. All right, know the function and key differences between apocrine and merocrine slash ecrine sweat glands, and then I'll talk about a couple other things here. Uh, <clears throat> so apocrine sweat glands, they're named after the type of secretions. A apocrine secretions, uh, just the apical or top portion of a cell breaks off and releases secretions. Merocrine just means that cell uh, things are churned out of cells, and there's something called holocrine secretion where the whole cell just pops open and releases its content. That's actually what a sebaceous gland would do. But apocrine sweat glands, they're basically going to be found in your armpits, around your nipples, and in your groin. Those will be the key places you find apocrine sweat glands. Merocrine or ecrine sweat glands, they're going to be everywhere. So the function of apocrine sweat glands, it produces a thick, sticky, cloudy sweat type of sweat. And it's, and it's more triggered by stress and hormones, like going through puberty, than it is um, temperature. That's why all, you have to have a conversation with a boy someday and tell him, hey, you're starting to stink. You didn't stink when you were a boy, but now that you're turning into a man, these sweat glands are turning out um, the sweat. And it isn't what causes body odor. Uh, it's actually, so bacteria feed on this thick, sticky, cloudy sweat, and that's what causes body odor. So it's actually, you're smelling the bacteria that are feeding on our apocrine sweat when somebody has body odor. So that's apocrine sweat glands. So armpits, nipples groin, thick, sticky, cloudy um, sweat that um, they believe it may have a role, may play a role like in pherom a pheromonal role, like communication between, between humans. Um, and we know that that's where the BO comes from. Merocrine or ecrine sweat glands, they're going to be distributed all over your body and their job is temperature regulation. So when it gets warm, these merocrine sweat glands will, will start to secrete more sweat to, so sweat evaporation can cool you off. So that's the key locations, functions, and differences between apocrine and merocrine sweat glands. I like to use the term merocrine, but I do see a lot of resources use this term ecrine, which is why I wanted to bring it up. All right, so we talked about sebaceous glands. We talked about um, merocrine and ap apocrine sweat glands. We also have mammary glands, which produce breast milk for lactation. And we have ceruminous glands. Cerumen is earwax. So... I think that's it. You'll notice that I didn't. I didn't talk a lot about hair and nail. That's just something that I don't. I don't spend a lot of time on the. Te you know, the textbook and some of your other resources will cover it, but uh, um, I just don't. I don't think it's super significant compared to the other parts of this chapter. So, all right, get your learn on. Good luck.